last message is Mayim Hayim Hinam. Our text we're going to be in John chapter 7. In John chapter 7, we find that Yeshua, now for those of you that don't know, Yeshua is the Hebrew name of the person that generally appears in the Bible as Jesus. Because he was born a Hebrew in the land of Israel, he had a Hebrew name, and that name was Yeshua. And when you translate Yeshua into Greek, like the New Testament is, you get Iesus. Transliterate. And you transliterate, yeah, you get Iesus, which is the Greek way to say Yeshua. Then you translate Iesus. Transliterate. Transliterate. <laughs> Jesus in English, you get Jesus. Okay, so when I talk about Yeshua, I'm talking about the one that you, that most people would call Jesus. It's the same person who's just using his Hebrew name. In John chapter 7, I'm going to begin reading at verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, gee, I wonder what feast that is. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeshua stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What's the Hebrew word for living water? Mayim Chaim. Mayim Chaim, exactly. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Yeshua was not yet glorified. Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to bring forth the Word of God tonight. Father, I pray that you'll give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand the message of the Spirit to His people tonight. We ask these things in Yeshua. Amen. Now, when I read this, you know what leaped out at me? Yeshua was at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now those who claim that Yeshua did away with all those Old Testament things need to pay special notice to the fact that Yeshua was at the Feast of Tabernacles. As defined in that Old Testament book of Leviticus Chapter 23. Now, Albert Edersheim, in his book, The Temple and Its Ministries, has this to say about the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? He says this. He's talking about a special service that occurred at the temple. He says, as at the Passover and at Pentecost, being also so at tabernacles. The altar of burnt offering was cleansed during the first night watch and the gates of the temple were thrown open immediately after midnight. The time till the beginning of the ordinary morning sacrifice was occupied in examining the various sacrifices and offerings that were to be brought during the day. While the morning sacrifice was being prepared, a priest, accompanied by a joyous procession with music, went down to the pool of Siloam, whence he drew water into a golden pitcher, capable of holding three log, which is rather more than two pints. Okay? But on the Sabbaths, they fetched the water from a golden vessel in the temple itself, into which it had been carried from Siloam on the preceding day. At the same time that the procession started for Siloam, another went to a place in the Kedron Valley, close by, called Moza, whence they brought willow branches, which amidst the blasts of the priest trumpets, they struck on either side of the altar of burnt offering, bending them over towards it, so as to form a kind of leafy canopy. Then the ordinary sacrifice proceeded, the priest who had gone to Siloam so timing it that he returned just as his brethren carried up the pieces of the sacrifice to lay them on the altar. As he entered by the water gate, 
which obtained its name from this ceremony, he was received by a threefold blast from the priest's trumpet. The priest then went up the rise to the altar and turned to the left where there were two silver basins with narrow holes, the eastern a little wider for the wine and the western somewhat narrower for the water. Into these the wine of the drink offering was poured and at the same time the water from Siloam. The people shouting to the priest, Raise thy hand! to show that he really poured the water into the basin, which led to the base of the altar. For, sharing the objections of the Sadducees, Alexander Janaeus, the Maccabean king priest about 95 BC, had shown his contempt for the Pharisees by pouring the water at this feast upon the ground on which the people pelted him with their etrogs, <laughs> and would have murdered him if his foreign bodyguard had not interfered, on which occasion no less than 6,000 Jews were killed in the temple. As soon as the water and the wine were being poured out, the temple music began, and the Hallel, Psalms 113-118, through 118, was sung in the manner previously prescribed, and to the accompaniment of flutes except on the Sabbath and on the first day of the feast when flute playing was not allowed on account of the sanctity of the days. When the choir came to these words, O give thanks to the Lord, and again when they sang, O work then now salvation, Yahweh, and once more at the close, O give thanks unto the Lord, all the worshippers shook their lulahs toward the altar. When therefore the multitudes from Jerusalem on meeting Yeshua cut down branches from the trees and strewed them in the way and cried, saying, O then work now salvation to the son of David, they applied in reference to Messiah what was regarded as one of the chief ceremonies of the Feast of Tabernacles, praying that God would now from the highest heavens manifest and send that salvation in connection with the son of David, which was symbolized by the pouring out of water. For though the ceremony was considered by the rabbis as bearing a subordinate reference to the dispensation of rain, the annual fall of which they imagined was determined by God at that feast, its main and real application was to the future outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as predicted probably in allusion to this very rite by Isaiah the prophet. Thus the Talmud says distinctly, Why is the name of it called the drawing out of water? Because of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, according to what is said, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. Hence also the feast and the peculiar joyousness of it are alike designated as those of the drawing out of water, for according to the rabbinical authorities, the Holy Spirit dwells in man only through joy. A similar symbolism was expressed by another ceremony which took place at the close, not of the daily, but of the festive sacrifices. On every one of the seven days, the priest formed in procession and made the circuit of the altar, singing, O then, now work salvation, Yahweh. O Yahweh, give prosperity. But on the seventh, that great day of the feast, they made the circuit of the altar seven times, remembering how the walls of Jericho had fallen in similar circumstances and anticipating how, by the direct interposition of God, the walls of heathenism would fall before Yahweh and the land lie open for his people to go in and possess it. We can now in some measure realize the event recorded in John chapter 7 verse 37. The festivities of the week of tabernacles were drawing to a close. It was the last day, that great day of the feast. It obtained this name, although it was not one of the one of holy convocation, partly because it closed the feast and partly from the circumstances which procured it in rabbinical writings and designations of Day of the Great Hoshana. Hoshana. On account of the sevenfold circuit of the altar with Hoshana and the day of willows and the day of beating of branches, because all the leaves were shaken off the willow boughs and the palm branches beaten in pieces by the side of the altar. It was on that day, after the priest had returned from Siloam with his golden pitcher, and for the last time poured its contest to the base of the altar, after the Hallel had been sung to the sound of the flute, the people responded. 
and worshiping as the priests three times during the threefold blast from their silver trumpets, just when the interest of the people had been raised to its highest pitch, that from amidst the mass of worshipers who were waving toward the altar quite a forest of weavy branches, as the last words of Psalm 118 were chanted, a voice was raised which sounded through the temple, startled the multitude, and carried fear and hatred to the hearts of the leaders. It was Yeshua who stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Then by faith in him should each one truly become like the pool of Siloam, and from his innermost being rivers of living waters flow. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Thus the significance of the rite in which they had just taken part was not only fully explained, but the mode of its fulfillment pointed out. The effect was instantaneous. It could not be, it could not but be that in the, that vast assembly, so suddenly roused by being brought face to face with him in whom every type and prophecy is fulfilled, there would be many who, when they heard this saying, said, Of truth, mm -hmm. this is the prophet. Others said, This is Messiah. Even the temple guard, whose duty it would have been in such circumstances to arrest one who had so interrupted the services of the day and presented himself to the people in such a light, owned the spell of his words and dared not to lay hands on him. Never spake man like this man was the only account they could give of their unusual weakness in answer to the reproaches of the chief priests and Pharisees. The rebuke of the Jewish authorities which followed is too characteristic to require comment. One only of their number had been deeply moved by the scene just witnessed in the, tent, in the temple. Yet, timid as usually, Nicodemus only laid hold of this one point that the Pharisees had traced the popular confession of Yeshua to their ignorance of the law, to which he replied in the genuine rabbinic manner of arguing without meeting one's opponent face to face. Doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? Now that was a long bit of passage to read, I understand that. But it shed some light on what's going on. Now Yeshua stood up on the last great day of the feast, and he explained the significance of the rite that they just gone through the pouring out of the water, and he also showed them the true source of living water himself. So let's look at this. What is Ma'im Chaim? What is living water? Let's look to the scriptures. We're going to look uh, in Psalm 36. Okay, and then we're going to look in Proverbs 13. Huh? No, I'll help you. Alright. Psalm 36, verses 7 through 9, please. Christian numbering? Yeah. How precious God is your grace. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the rich bounty of your house. And you have them drink from the stream of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. We see light. How far am I going? To nine. That was nine. Okay. In Proverbs 13, verse 14, we read this. The law of the wise is a fountain of youth to depart from the snares of death. I want you to go to Jeremiah 2. In Proverbs 14, verse 27, we read this. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. To depart from the snares of death. Jeremiah 2. Yeah. Verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and dug themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Okay, and in Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 13, we read this. 
O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Okay. Now, in Psalm 36, that she just read to you, tells us that God is a fountain of life. In Proverbs 13, it tells us that the law of the wise is a fountain of life. In Proverbs 14, it tells us that the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. In Jeremiah 2 and Jeremiah 17, tells us that God himself is a fountain of living water, or life, same thing. Now in John chapter 4, verses 5 through 14, we have the story of Yeshua's encounter with a woman at the well. Okay, and in this, to make a long story short, he tells her that he is the source of living water. Now back in Proverbs 13, when we read that the law of the wise is a fountain of life, the law of the wise is the same thing as the commandments of God, the Torah, because wise people keep Torah. Okay, and since it's a law, then it's referring to the commandments of God, okay? The Torah. So those who view the Torah as being done away with have, in essence, cut off a significant source of living water from their lives. And since we know from studying the scriptures that Yeshua is the living Torah... Thus, one could almost say that cutting the Torah out of your life is equivalent to cutting Yeshua out of your life. That's a dangerous thought to think, isn't it? But Mayim Chaim, the living water, is God himself in our lives. We have been called to partake of Mayim Chaim. We have been called to partake of living waters. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, it says this. It says, Haruach ve hakala omrim bo. Hashomea yomar na bo. Hatsumea vo na hikafates yikhak na maim haim hinam. And I probably butchered the Hebrew. But want you to read it in English. Verse 17. Uh, the spirit and the bride say, Come, let anyone who hears say, Come, and let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life free of charge. Okay, keep your finger right there. What a beautiful invitation that is. Let anyone who's thirsty come and drink. What did Yeshua say? He said, I am the living water. Come to me and drink. If anyone thirsts, come to me and drink. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Messiah, for making Mayim Chaim, the living water, available to us as a free gift. Finally, the final reward for believers is access to the waters of life for all eternity. Would you please read verses 1 and 2 of Revelation 22. Next, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Between the main street and the river was the tree of life, producing 12 kinds of fruit, a different kind every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing, or for healing the nations. Okay. So we can see from that scripture that those who believe Yeshua and do not cut out the source of Mayim Chaim, the Torah, will have eternal access to the river of life and to the tree of life. I don't know about you, but that's something that I want to partake of. Mm -hmm. Don't you? Now those who might see, to those of you who might see this message on YouTube, if you have faith in Messiah, but you have cut out the Torah, a source of Mayim Chaim, then I want to urge you 
to look into this issue and reconsider whether your actions on this, reconsider your actions on this, and reconsider whether cutting that Torah out of your life was such a wise step to make because you cut off a source of living water. And we need all we can get. Amen? Amen. A bicycle with one wheel is still a bicycle, but it's not going to get you where you want to go very fast. A bicycle with one wheel, Yeshua, and with another wheel, the Torah, will get you where you want to go much more efficiently. Amen? So, on this last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles, let us partake of Mayim Chaim Chinam. Let us partake of living water freely. And all y'all's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.